Back in May, I made what I said would probably be my last episode of When Nature Unearths the Dead. The reason I said this is because I felt I had run out of cases that were both interesting and relevant to a very specific subject matter. But after a lot of requests to do another video, I dug a little deeper. In January of 1928, numerous newspapers across the UK featured amongst their columns the story of Johann Tarala. He was a farmer of Austrian descent who lived in Kolkova, in the Moravia region of Czechoslovakia. He had spent most of his adult life working his own private land, and wanted the best for his family. He married young, and he and his wife had 12 children, 10 of which survived into adulthood. When his eldest son, Johann Jr., married after the First World War, he was gifted ten acres of the land by his father. As Johann Sr. grew older, the once hard-working man's health began to deteriorate. He became less mobile and unable to work the hours he used to. His wife became frustrated at this and often accused Johann of being lazy. By this time, Johann Jr. had become dissatisfied with the ten acres given to him by his father, he said that it was no longer enough to meet the family's needs, and requested full ownership of all the land. Johann Jr. had the support of his mother, and for some time both made constant demands that all the land be handed over. Johann Sr. knew that he had been less productive, but he refused to hand over ownership. This disagreement lasted for months, and at times Johann Sr. was physically attacked in his home, which often led to him finding refuge in the house of a neighbour, that is, until the celebrations of Easter weekend in 1926, during which time Johann Sr. disappeared from the family home. Word spread of the farmer's sudden absence after his wife visited neighbours' houses weeping, telling them that her husband was missing and that the family feared the worst. All searches for Johann were in vain, and it was eventually accepted by the people of the village that Johann had probably taken his own life. His wife and son said that he had most likely drowned himself in a lake close to his farmland. Despite no body being found, this theory was accepted at the time, without much more investigation. In the wake of the mystery that surrounded Johann Tarala, his son took control of the land, and as the months passed, his disappearance was almost completely forgotten. That is until one bitterly cold spell in March of 1927, when a pack of starving foxes searched the nearby communal wood for food. Their search brought them to a desolate area of the wood, and from beneath the near-frozen ground, they dragged out a heavily decomposed body. The remains were discovered by the people of the village before they were completely ravaged. On investigation, local law enforcement found that they undoubtedly belonged to Johann Tarala. He had suffered extensive skull fractures and several other broken bones, in what looked like a frenzied attack. What followed was a somewhat late but extensive investigation by police. Johann Jr. was considered the prime suspect for his father's murder, the motivation being the inheritance of his land. Johann Jr. had been in police custody for several weeks, before eventually admitting to attacking and killing his father, but insisted it was at the instigation of his mother. In January of 1928, both the wife and son of Johann Tarala were sentenced to life imprisonment for his murder. In part two of this series, I covered a 1930 story from St Andrews in Scotland, in which a man named John Wilson found human skeletal remains inside a stone coffin that had been exposed due to a recent landslide close to a coastal landmark known as the Rock and Spindle. A few years later, the same John Wilson, who I now know was a veteran sailor, stumbled upon a second set of remains in the same area of St Andrews at the Kinkel Braes. This discovery came in April of 1937. Wilson was walking along the cliff path when he noticed a landslide had occurred in the cliff's edge. 
As he drew closer, he saw the full, well-preserved skeleton of what he described as a young person. He said he formed this opinion because, on closer inspection, the jawbone didn't appear to be fully formed, and the teeth were in perfect condition. The skeleton was sitting upright, with its feet resting on a rock, and gave the impression of someone simply resting and looking out to sea. As the area was never a burial ground to his knowledge, Wilson suspected that the person had fallen victim to an earlier landslide, which covered them in earth while they sat alone at the foot of the cliff. John Wilson said that he had initially intended to pay a visit to St Andrews University professor, surgeon and anatomist David Waterston the next day, to inform him of what he had found. Wilson cancelled the visit due to bad weather, but a Madras college teacher agreed to accompany him the following day to examine the find and to take a photograph. By then, however, yet another, more extensive landslide had occurred, reburying the bones. To the north of the town, where the sea meets rocky terrain, is a tidal pool known as Witch Lake, overlooking which lake is Witch Hill. During the 16th and 17th centuries, women suspected of being witches were taken to Witch Lake, bound in rope and thrown in. If they drowned, they were considered innocent. The upside to this being, according to tradition at the time, was that they would then go to heaven. If they somehow managed to stay afloat, they were accused of witchcraft, taken to Witch Hill and burned at the stake. During the first week of February 1904, a storm swept into St Andrews. The high breaking waves caused a large landslide at Witch Hill, exposing two human skeletons. The skeletons were believed to be 400 to 500 years old. They were embedded in sand, their feet were facing east, and they were thought to have been 40 feet below the ground level. It was immediately assumed that these were the remains of the accused witches from centuries past. However, as the investigation progressed, many other skeletons, both male and female, were found on the same spot. In 1904, when the story broke, other possible theories were put forward. Some believed that the skeletons were the remnants of a great battle, while others said that the dead were the victims of an ancient plague, possibly the Black Death outbreak of the 14th century. A local historian by the name of Mr Kinskill put another theory forward. Greyfriars Garden Road lies a short distance southwest of Witch Hill. Kinskill said that a cemetery once stood on the land that now occupies Greyfriars Garden Road, and when the Witch Hill area was first built upon, Debris was transported there from the old cemetery, along with the buried dead. So whether they were accused witches, victims of a plague, lives lost in battle, or the occupants of an ancient gravesite, the storm of February 1904 brought to the surface another morbid glimpse at Scotland's past. The village of Lemmy Bryan in County Waterford lies nine miles from Ireland's south coast. It was on the outskirts of the village on Saturday May 7th 1938 that a man who was out walking found a human skull jutting out from a hole in the ground. Tattered clothing, other bones and what looked like a rotted walking stick also lay nearby. This area, like much of Ireland that year, had been badly affected by a month-long drought between April and May and the once waterlogged and boggy ground had completely dried out, revealing the once submerged remains. News of the so-called bog body caused a great deal of excitement, especially in the nearby village of Strad Valley. Most of the inhabitants there firmly believed that a nine-year-old mystery that had hung over the coastal village had finally been solved. On Christmas Day back in 1929, a local postman went missing without a trace. His name was Lawrence Griffin. After an investigation, nothing was found. Marshland was searched, a flooded mine shaft was dragged, and recently dug graves in the local cemetery were investigated. The Whelan's pub in Strad Valley, where Griffin was said to have been drinking that day, was also searched. Eight men and two women were arrested and charged for murder and disposing of a body with intent to obstruct a coroner's inquest. However, no substantial evidence was ever brought against them, and they were eventually released. For a few days, mystery surrounded the body in the bog, and all had hoped that the fate of Lawrence Griffin had eventually come to light. 
However, the pathologist Dr. John McGrath, who inspected the remains, found a number of newspaper fragments and personal items inside a tin that was found with the deceased. The fragments of newspaper which were skillfully cleaned, pieced together and displayed on glass, clearly showed the date, November 21st, 1932. As Lawrence Griffin had gone missing in 1929, this was the first piece of evidence that practically excluded him. But it was an old pension book, also dated 1932, that put the mystery to rest. The name Murphy could just about be seen on the papers. It was recalled that in 1932, a man named John Murphy, known locally as Wexford Murphy, had gone missing that same year. He was 75 years old at the time of his disappearance. He had lived at an address in Ballymacabry, 17 miles northwest of where his remains were found. The pensions officer, John Balk, who consigned Murphy's pension book, recalled doing so personally and recognised his own handwriting on the document. Also, the walking stick found nearby was much like the one used by Murphy, so it was decided, beyond doubt, that the body in the Lemmy Bryan bog was that of John Wexford Murphy. At an inquest in June of 1938, it was announced that John Murphy had died of quote, old age and exposure in 1932, sometime during late November or December. Had it not been for the drought of 38, his body may never have been found. The fate of Lawrence Griffin, however, is still a mystery. In July of this year, a friend of mine made a discovery in a wooded area of Oak Creek, Wisconsin during a live stream on his YouTube channel. There isn't much background information on who the deceased was, or if it was a human at all, but he returned the next day to review the find. I was here yesterday during a live stream, and I wanted to come back today and kind of document this area, show you guys what I found yesterday and maybe pick your brain out there and let me know what you think any of this stuff is out here is I think I found a very old grave and I will show it to you I'll show you guys a few clues on why I think it's a grave I'd be very curious to hear what you guys think about this and this could either be the grave of a Native American there was a very heavy Native American population in Wisconsin, or it could have been a very early settler from the 1800s or early 1900s. Uh, the first clue that I found yesterday during my live stream was this human bone, or I shouldn't call it a human bone just yet, but there is a definite bone that has grown up with the tree. And my theory is you can also see that there is a flat stone. I can't lift it up because it's kind of wedged in this tree growth here. The tree has kind of swallowed that rock as well. It's very thin, it's very flat, and it looks decorative like it could have been a headstone for a final resting place. And the third clue that I found was there are rocks, field stones, and these are huge. So these had to be moved with purpose. But they are about the length of a grave. Just one little row right there, leading up to that big tree, which I think was planted by a loved one upon burial of their deceased loved one. And this tree is very large. I don't know what kind of tree this is, but it's it's 150 years old, at least, somewhere around there. It's so big that there, there's other trees kind of growing out from the same tree. I just want to give you guys another little viewing here. And you guys comment below and let me know what you think this is. But it just seems like all the pieces fit that this could be a human burial site. I'm not going to disturb it at all. I'm just paying respects by 
recording this just to kind of keep the memory alive. I don't think I'll be back out here again now. Give you guys another viewing of that bone there. It was Wednesday, March 2nd, 1949, when a hunter was tracking down rabbits in a field close to the city of Arras in northern France. As he approached and then made his way across what he believed to be the surface of a rabbit warren, his foot, followed by his entire leg, broke through the earth. As he attempted to pull himself out, he realised that his leg had broken through rusted sheet metal, and was now hanging freely in a cavernous underground space. After eventually pulling himself free, the rabbit hunter excavated a little further, and found himself staring down into a large subterranean room. When investigators arrived at the scene shortly afterwards, it was discovered that beneath that unassuming field in the north of France was a German-occupied military hospital from the First World War. The subterranean base, it was soon discovered, had been covered by great mounds of earth when a shell struck nearby in 1918. A significant historical find, but the true horror of what befell that underground hospital was still unrealised. When the investigation team, armed with torches, lowered themselves in, they found rows of beds against sheet metal walls, and on every one of those beds were the skeletal remains of what were once patients. Those who had suffered severe injury were missing arms or legs, while others were intact. Beside some of those bodies were the skeletons of the medics who had once tended to them. One scene in particular, it was reported, showed a bedridden skeleton, with a second skeleton slumped beside the bed, with medical apparatus still in its hands, as if the person had been attempting an operation at the time of death. German helmets and rifles were found stacked against the doors, and the communication trenches leading in and out of the base had been sealed off by expelled earth. It's likely that the base was buried during 1918's Second Battle of the Somme, when the British army widened their attack into the Arras region. It's thought that most, if not all of the live inhabitants, would have survived the initial explosion, only to suffocate in the darkness. <laughs> 